Russia is about to elect a new president. There's no doubt who it's going to be. The same man who has ruled unchecked for the last 18 years. Now it's classical one-man dictatorship. That's what always happens with dictators. You look at Hitler and Stalin, it's always, you know, step by step, step by step. The real Vladimir Putin remains an enigma. So who is the world's most powerful and feared leader? We talk to the presidents he has threatened. He said, your friends are making lots of nice promises to you, but they never deliver. I don't promise you anything nice, but they always do. The Western leaders, whose vulnerability he has exploited. Putin has invented new kinds of warfare, which Western countries are still struggling to come to terms with. What is called this full spectrum uh, capability. And the inner circle of intimates who made him president in the first place. Первое, я бы сказал, что Путин очень слабый человек. Второе. Uh, это человек завистливый и алчный. Ну и третье – это человек, который постоянно врет. Владимир Путин's psyche has been forged on the anvil of absolute power. The consequences for the future of the world are nothing if not significant. It's not if Putin would attack, it's only when and where. Putin's had long enough. It's time for somebody else. Really, a time time for a change is is the, is the root of what you should be saying. Ksenia Sobchak is one of eight Russian presidential candidates. Vladimir Putin has been a family friend for decades. One important goal is to speak to the world, to to make them understand that Russia is not Putin. She's meeting Lord Bell, one-time Thatcher confidant for some strategic advice. You're a woman for a start. That gives you an immediate advantage over Putin. That's no, sure. Every other contestant. A young woman. It wasn't true of Thatcher. Wasn't that Thatcher had never never thought of herself as a woman. So <laughs> she thought of herself as a politician. Um, That's true. I've we, actually met her in St. Petersburg, yes. you know, and I know you worked with her. Yeah, I but Sobchak knows her family friend all too well. He isn't going to allow her to win. After elections, I, mean, I hope it yeah. will be a big result. Yeah. We understand that chances of winning yeah. are quite minimal right now, so to say. But I never say that, would you? Yes, I, I am I saying say it. it. You should always tell people you're going to win. You want people to vote for you, you know. But in Russia, you know, people know that Putin will win. He created the system that allows only him to win. So the system is unfair. There were no hints of the future Tsar back in the 70s. Born to poor parents in a tough suburb, he fought his way to university and then a lowly KGB post. But that only lasted as long as the Soviet Union. Самого Путина, я знал я его очень давно, там с 92 года. Мы жили с соседями на даче, то есть вот через забор. То есть моя дача здесь, его здесь. Путин, в силу того, что он был офицером КГБ, независимо какого уровня, то есть он был очень низкого уровня, то есть таких были тысячи выброшенных системой, выброшенных с Советским Союзом на улицу. У Путина не было амбиций, у него не было никаких амбиций, ни карьерных, не было амбиций ни каких-то политических, это вообще об этом речи не было. И Случайно Путин попал, собственно, в мэрию там и так далее. In the chaos of the time, Mayor and Natalie Sobchak needed a tough guy, and the KGB officer fitted the role perfectly. From being a, you know, a grey-faced KGB agent, just a servant of the state, he becomes a personality, and so the ego starts to, to grow. 
struggling to understand the unfolding enigma of Vladimir Putin, successive world leaders have turned to one man for answers, a respected authority on power and the mind. The human brain has a single reward network, a single feel-good network that gets switched on whenever we feel paid a compliment, whenever we have sex, whenever we take cocaine, and whenever we have power and great success. What happens is you get a surge of intense pleasure and satisfaction from the stimulus, but as you repeat that at a high level, the brain needs more and more to achieve the same effect. That's called tolerance. It's an insatiable appetite. I don't think Putin was born to be an emperor. His brain was profoundly changed by the power he managed to get. In the late 1990s, post-Soviet Russia was on the brink of collapse. A drunk president, gang warfare, robber baron businessmen, openly contemptuous of the rule of law. Kremlin insiders knew the country needed a savior, any savior. Борис Николаевич искал среди своего окружения, своих своих близких людей, кто может возглавить страну, кого он может предложить народу, чтобы народ посмотрел на него и, если все удачно сложится, выбрал его. The obvious successor to Yeltsin was Deputy Prime Minister Boris Nemtsov, charismatic, eloquent, and principled. But Yeltsin hated him after he opposed the Chechen war. And there was somebody else. In 1996, Vladimir Putin had come to Moscow to work in the administration, keeping a low profile. Putin was a person who was not a сказать что-то, когда его не спрашивали, но когда очередь до него доходила, и ему нужно было сказать, он говорил. Поэтому, когда необходимо было что-то сказать, он формулировал, формулировал очень точно, и это это было важно. Я строил машину, которая должна выбрать президента, независимо от того, кто этот человек. Gleb Pavlovsky was Boris Yeltsin's spin doctor, and he was tasked with preparing the succession. Кроме того, я разрабатывал сценарий компании и следил за тем, чтобы игра шла по нему. В сценарии уже были заложены основные пункты победы, то есть свойства кандидата как энергичного молодого спортивного на фоне старого уходящего больного Ельцина это все уже было в сценарии Путин с моей точки зрения играл очень хорошо То есть лично я пытался уговорить Путина стать президентом. Now he's locked in a bitter legal conflict with Putin's government. But back in the 90s, his old Dacha neighbor was also a Kremlin insider. Когда я предложил, я помню, где это было, это было в Кремле в 14-м корпусе. Мы были в его кабинете. Путин ответил категорически нет, что я этого не хочу. Это была для него нереальная абсолютно ситуация. Выборы должны были произойти летом. Я понимал, что Путина, которого не знает ни один человек в России, сделать кандидатом за шесть месяцев. И моей идеей было то, что нужно просто Ельцину уйти. Тогда Путин остается исполняющим обязанности президента. То есть он, по сути, уже становится без выборов президентом. И так случилось. Клянусь, при осуществлении полномочий 
президента Российской Федерации. If you're made president, that's one big, big rush. <laughs> that is an enormous biological hit to the reward network. Suddenly, you're no longer just subject to the corporatist ideology of the communist regime. That regime is dead. You are now in charge of a new regime. That is a rush to the brain. That is a rush to the brain. You have not been brought up with the notion that there are constraints in power. You know, you've been brought up in a system that has no democracy to it. That ideology has gone, the communist ideology has gone, so he's left without an ideology. The ideology he's witnessed in St. Petersburg and around him is an ideology of power, of power and money. Мы вместе отстояли мир, не дали перекроить историю, защитили большую советскую родину. Putin asked me at that time, just uh, two days after he became acting president, he called for me and offered me the position of prime minister. I listed my conditions, and those conditions were just very simple, just um, like 10, 15 reforms, which I understood and uh, were absolutely sure Russia badly needed. And he accepted that. And uh, the, only, uh, the only requirement from his side was just don't step on his field, on presidential field. Um, I decided to accept this. Mr. Putin uh, implemented his promises. He supported all the reforms, except one, uh, except the reform of gas sector. I first met him early in the year 2000. He was very much the apprentice leader. He had been surprised to find himself president of Russia. When he became president, everybody in Moscow was saying, who is this man? He had no political background. He'd hardly ever made a political speech. He was quite nervous, but also very sharp. He selected Tony Blair as the first foreign leader that he wished to meet because at the time Tony Blair was the preeminent leader in Europe, was at the height of his popularity. And in a sense, one felt that Putin was trying to learn from Tony Blair how to be a political leader. My impression of this was that here was a guy who was in charge, who was comfortable in his skin. Um, and of course, uh, Tony Blair was the same. So there was a lot of testosterone around. Now, Tony, one of the reasons he was so successful was he has a very strong sense of who he is and who he was, and also he likes himself and he likes his body. I mean, neither will thank me for saying this, but they are actually remarkably similar in many ways. Putin said, I want to make Russia a strong state again, and I want to reconnect it with the West. And he spent a lot of the next three to four years trying to get a seat at the top table of world and Western leaders. Question to um, President Bush, is this a man that Americans can trust? Uh, I I'll answer the question. I looked the man in the eye. I found him to be very straightforward and trustworthy. I was able to um, get a sense of his soul. The sight of their president back on the world stage, his team's success in stabilizing the country's battered economy, led to soaring personal approval ratings but also a desire for personal compensation. Тогда речь не шла там о миллиардах и так далее, но Путин понимал, что вот он какое-то время побудет, сейчас обязательно найдут кого-то другого, но он должен получить за это компенсацию очень большую, которая позволит ему всю оставшуюся жизнь жить спокойно, счастливо и богато. Богато. То есть это первое слово, это прямое слово. 
Но главное, что я хочу сказать, что Путин был очень бедный. То есть реально Путин был очень бедный. То есть я очень хорошо знаю его жену, я знаю его семью, я знаю его детей. Я помню, что первые компьютеры его детям я просто пошел, купил в магазине и подарил. Потому что у них не было компьютера. Компенсация, это условно говоря, там, это, ну, может быть, десятки, может быть, там, ну, я думаю, максимум это там для него на тот момент 10, 20, 30 миллионов долларов было бы вполне понятной компенсацией за все, что он сделал. При Ельцине этого не было. То есть не было такого, что человек получает пост министра, и он понимает, что это уже он заработал деньги. И, и Путин начинает тянуть людей. В основном это были выходцы из КГБ старые. I never uh, dreamed to become the member of the government, and actually I was deputy minister of transport, and that was just coincidentally. You know, the lazy argument in the West is that you only got these posts because you were a neighbor of Vladimir Putin. Uh, quite contrary. Uh, quite contrary. At that time, he was already in Moscow, and that was a pure invitation from the Ministry of Transport. It wasn't only a reward for a job well done. Ministers' rising compensation was a reflection of others' vast wealth. Uh, at that time, 46% of entire GDP of Russian Federation was produced by companies, privatized companies, which actually belong to eight families in Russian Federation. It is not known. You are the first to whom I am telling this openly. And what is the danger of a an economy that is controlled by eight people. Same like all over the world. Inequality. Just inequality. Putin now trained his sights on those eight men, the oligarchs. They'd been gifted their companies and huge wealth by the Yeltsin administration in a chaotic auction in return for political support. Early in 2003, the president engineered a gladiatorial clash. On the one side, the man who ruled Russia. On the other, the men who owned half of it. The chosen topic of conversation, corruption, a double-edged sword. Mikhail Khodorkovsky was the spokesman for the oligarchs, the fourth richest man in the world, suspected by the Kremlin of wanting to turn wealth into political influence. В 2002 году боюсь, что развилки, основные развилки уже были пройдены. Но, наверное, если бы я лучше понимал суть этого режима, именно как преступные группировки, я бы, наверное, мог бы лучше противодействовать этому режиму. I didn't pay much attention at that time because just it was announced that there would be a meeting devoted to uh, corruption. And the uh, oligarch's team uh, offered to uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky to make a presentation on their behalf. Масштабы коррупции в России оцениваемые экспертами четырех организаций приблизительно одинаковые. В районе 30 миллиардов оценивается долларов. Спасибо большое, Михаил Борисович. Позволю себе некоторые вещи отметить, прокомментировать. Ну, вот, э, спасибо вам за, за эти слайды. А, значит, Then вот Путин explode a little bit and saying how all of you and you particular Ходорковский got your wealth. А некоторые другие нефтяные компании, как, например, компания Юкус, имеют сверхзапасы. Как она их получила? Это вот вопрос вполне обсуждаемый сегодня на нами темы. I arranged this meeting. Yeah. You arranged this? Yes. What? Yeah. Просто 
На самом деле это было такое недопонимание двух людей. То есть Ходорковский не понял, что он сказал, потому что он не знал Путина. Он пытался ему что-то сказать, но в обратную сторону это воспри было воспринято как просто жесточайшее оскорбление его. Потому что на самом деле Ходорковский говорил какие-то глупости, реальные глупости. Понимаете, вам трудно представить сейчас, а мне, что я этого мог не понимать тогда. А мне тогда было очень трудно себе представить, зная до этого Горбачева, зная до этого Ельцина, зная до этого Примакова и так далее. Я знал всех этих людей, кто-то из них был хороший, кто-то из них был плохой, кто-то из них был ужасный, но при этом это были все-таки политические лидеры, для которых а, вопрос политических решений, вопрос страны стоял во-первых. Я абсолютно не мог себе представить, что я столкнусь с ситуацией, когда президент страны думает о личных деньгах. Ходорковский's fatal mistake was that he chose a massive oil deal as his major example of corruption. A deal which it turned out his president knew everything about. Mr. Putin started to explain me in the many, many details. He knew everything in details. That was brought me to the, to the understanding that something wrong started to, to, started to appear, that he knew uh, about the terms of this transaction. Mikhail, он советовался со мной. Я сказал, а если не только Сечин, но и Путин был в доле этого отката от продажи северной нефти? Это было накануне вечером дома. И Михаил сказал, я никогда не поверю, что президент такой страны может получать взятки в размере 100-200 миллионов долларов. Я просто не понимаю, зачем. И он ошибся. В том числе и, значит... Путин, это, э, э, не, он настолько, это, по сути, пожалуй, было, ну вот, первый раз э, я видел его таким взволнованным после этой встречи. И я показал ему так, сказал, я обойду просто, ну, выйду со всеми и приду. И он взял меня за рукав и сказал, пойдем, пойдем, пойдем. Он мне сказал, слушай, вот этот Ходорковский, я просто ужасный человек я... и вообще я вот проверил мне написали справки я вообще знаю что он там не платил никакие деньги и он вообще захватил эту нефтяную компанию бесплатно и я вообще считаю что так нельзя делать это короче говоря надо все забрать Путин was as good as his private word Podakovsky was slammed in jail and his vast business sold off first to a vodka bar in Siberia and then to a company controlled by one of the president's closest allies. This was a turning point because UCOS was the poster child for the Russian oil industry. It was very well regarded in the West and you thought you are damaging Russia's uh, image in the Western business world. You're damaging the chances of getting more investment in. So it seemed like a pretty high risk policy, but for Putin, Zapping Horokovsky was so important that the economic considerations took second place. The West may not have liked it, but ordinary Russians did. They were delighted to see their president taking on the hated oligarchs. And it wasn't the only sign of a newfound personal confidence. Russia and Belarus were negotiating a gas deal and talks broke down. I instructed Gazprom to continue to supply. It's February, minus 25 in Minsk, continue to supply, then later we negotiate. And next morning, just Prime Minister of Poland calling me, Prime Minister of Lithuania, just uh, the governor of Kaliningrad region. What's going on? We have no gas. Because just they were on the same, on the same line, on the same pipeline. President of Gazprom, he said, Putin instructed me to, to, to cut supplies. And then we will shout it to each other. So what did he say? <laughs> he said he didn't respect, Lukashenko didn't respect me. 
I, Putin, asked him personally just to accept this price, and he didn't. He didn't sign a contract. He didn't respect me. Two weeks after I was, uh, I was fired. The whole cabinet was fired just uh, two weeks prior to elections. <laughs> Stability at home, his vast country once again at peace, and a cabinet under his direct control. It looks like the new president has single-handedly reversed the years of decline. One of the features of unlimited power is the acquired narcissism that occurs. And the acquired narcissism leads to, you know, a really enormously inflated ego. You know, you're teaching cranes to fly, or you're fighting bears, you're wrestling tigers. You're just the smartest, cleverest, strongest, best-looking guy in, in, in the world. <laughs> and, you know, if you inflate an ego enough, then the vulnerability of it increases proportionately. Then trouble broke out where he least expected it, Georgia. Revolution swept away his allies and a cultish reformer took power, Mikhail Saakashvili. My first uh, contact uh, with uh, Vladimir Putin was during my first official visit to Moscow. They tried to be sweet. Uh, he actually rolled out red, red carpet, it was full official. Uh, visit ceremony. The whole uh, setting was meant to be a kind of recruiting session because uh, Putin first took us to the office that he said that it was former office of Stalin. And then he took off his tie jacket, uh, invited me to do the same, and then sat down with me uh, in what was meant to be a very, you know, frank and open conversation. From the very first meeting, I asked him, so, so, Vladimir Vladimirovich, do you have any problems with our dealings with the Americas? No, he said, no. I am myself friends with George Bush. Of course, we strongly, uh, no, we are, are not in principle against you dealing with the Americas. We are just against you being slaves to the Americas. But then he told me something very clear. Uh, he told me that the sitting Georgian Minister of Security in Chevronadze's government, uh, he told me that this is our guy. We have very good experience of working with him. He really helped us a lot. And I hope he keeps his position. If he keeps his position, that will make it very easy, our, our cooperation. Second time I met and he asked, where is Haburzani? And I told him, well, he got promoted. We appointed him de as deputy prosecutor general. And he said, well, this is not a promotion. We wanted to have him as minister of internal security. Like that, he told me, oh, you are not going to fool me. Saakashvili, he enjoyed sort of poking the bear in the eye, and that's not always a very wise policy, and some people around him advised him not to do it, and he would have been better advised not to do it. The psychological and the personal now plays a much bigger role in international politics because of the old certainties, the old tectonic plates of ideology and of, of interests between blocks. They've all gone. And we're now in a system where human, individual human psychology and personality plays much more of a role. To Putin's intense irritation, Bush immediately responded to Saakashvili's overtures, reversing the pro-Russian stance he'd earlier held. Georgia is today both sovereign and free and a beacon of liberty for this region and the world. Putin began to believe that the Americans could never be trusted, a view strengthened as the tide of revolution reached neighboring Ukraine. Now to the political crisis in Ukraine. The Orange Revolution pitted Putin's man, incumbent Viktor Yanukovych, against challenger Viktor Yushchenko, 
who the Kremlin thought was a US puppet. At the polls, Yushchenko won, despite the best efforts of Putin's personal spin doctor. Putin был в этом уверен на сто процентов, а я на 70. Это была на самом деле открытая борьба, в которой Москва проиграла. That was a massive humiliation for Putin, and it was the shakiest moment of his 18 years in power. For three months after that, people in Moscow were actually asking whether he would last to the end of his presidential term. It was a huge defeat for him because he was perceived as sort of having lost Ukraine. It's a defeat the president has never forgotten and never forgiven. He could never trust the West again. A perception its politicians, glorying in democracy's victory in Ukraine, only strengthened. From the West's point of view, this was the end of history. Um, liberal capitalism had triumphed. That was a bit tough on the Russians, but there we are. And I wish we'd handled it differently. Imagine if in the United Kingdom, there had not just been Scottish independence, or Welsh independence, Northern Irish independence, but the Northwest and the, and the Northeast of England and the Southwest had also decided to declare independence. So we didn't really factor that in, in my view. And we then scared the Russians with this absolutely fundamental anxiety they've always had about being encircled. In hindsight, uh, I think that we, we created the, the anxieties and we could have avoided them from which many of Putin's subsequent policies followed. In 2005, everything changes. Vladimir Putin turns inward, back to Russia and its people. Gone modernization, gone attempts to woo the fickle West. Instead, Putin is Russia, Russia is Putin, is the new slogan. He will rebuild his country himself. Молодежные и немолодежные организации, чтобы иметь какую-то массовую опору. But there's a looming problem. Two years time, Putin has to stand down. A new president is to be elected, and liberal opponents are already starting their campaigns, notably chess grandmaster Garry Kasparov. It was a very different game uh, from one that I've been playing before, because that was a game without a sort of clear winning combination. In 2007, there still was a chance for Putin to walk away, already probably a richest man in the world, and with massive influence, and by the way, with decent reputation. This is the world's most famous chess player, then still ranked number one. Definitely one of the most recognizable faces in Russia. Absolutely the most recognizable face in Russia outside of, you know, movie stardom and Putin. Certainly the man that, you know, if you asked anybody anywhere in Russia, you know, who's the smartest man in Russia? They would probably say Garry Kasparov. He almost immediately went on tour. And I was with him on this little charter plane. Within the space of a week, like things started shutting down. First, we had to give up the plane. 
because they would no longer let him land. In Beslan, he couldn't get the venue where he was supposed to speak. They said that um, they had a burst pipe, or they had an electri electrical failure. Wherever, everywhere we went, it was either a burst pipe or an, electri or an electrical failure. I think that was the first place where he got stuff thrown at him, and we actually thought it was a gunshot. By the time we got to Stavropol, which is the largest city in southern Russia, uh, it was no longer a chain of coincidences. So at this point, the plane is grounded. Uh, the place where he's supposed to speak has a burst pipe, and then we try to check into a hotel, and they say, no, you can't check into this hotel. We had a dinner booked for uh, 30 or 40 people from the local small business association. And we get to this restaurant, and there was one person there. And it emerged as we talked. She was from the small business organization. It emerged as we talked that she had lost her cell phone the day before. So she was the only one who wasn't called and threatened by the governor's people. The Grand Master soon finds himself under arrest. This, this regime is criminal, it's a police state. I have to say that compared to what we, we, we are seeing today, those were vegetarian times. Ten years ago, for protesting, peacefully protesting against, against Putin on the streets, you could end up in prison for five or ten days. Today, you would end up in prison for five to ten years. My first trial, which again, we ended up with a 40, 40 pounds fine. But the judge there, she set up the rules for the future because everything that happened with me was videotaped. I had a videotape, I had witnesses that proved that it, everything that they presented in the court was, was a lie. She said she trusted a policeman, one policeman, a police officer, over the rest of the, of the, of the pile of evidence because he, wo he, wore, he wore the uh, military uniform. Активисты, которые молодые, которые нападали на э, Каспарова, это, естественно, не, э, не то, чем я руководил. И, естественно, не то, о чем Путин отдавал бы приказ. Каспаров isn't the only one trying his luck. So is Mikhail Kasyanov, keen to return to power. I decided to run. I, I believed at that time we had a chance. I started to run, and at uh, that time it was necessary to collect two million signatures, and we did it. Then my, my rating of my support started to grow from 6%, which is usually like 5-6%, uh, up to 18%. And one month after, just they, they cut me out of elections, just describing that 35 signatures out of 2 million signatures, we believe not right, not correct. <laughs> With no Kasyanov or Kasparov in the mix, Putin's man, Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, succeeds him as president. But then, in defiance of the spirit, if not the letter of the Constitution, the new Prime Minister is Vladimir Putin. His country's future too important to relinquish, power too addictive to give up. Uh, that is absolutely clear for everyone in Russia that his successor, that is um, uh, simply just to keep the presidential seat warm. Uh, and he successfully implemented this goal Mr. Putin wanted him to do. This is why democracy was invented. Take anyone who is given absolute power for more than, say, eight or 10 years that will inevitably distort their behavior in ways that can be very dangerous. In 2006, Putin had pushed a law through parliament, allowing the KGB to kill traitors outside Russia. Months later, Alexander Litvinenko lay dead in London. The KGB defector, poisoned with radioactive polonium, 
after eating sushi and drinking tea in a Mayfair restaurant. I was on my way to London for a meeting with Tony Blair and um, uh, Litvinenko had been mur murdered a few days before that uh, and everybody was talking about it. So we had to stop over in Minsk, we went to see a summit after which we had a banquet. Uh, there was uh, Putin in the middle, uh, I was on his right hand and, and, Bill, and Lukashenko on his left one. And Lukashenko has this habit of uh, uh, poking Putin from time to time and m even making fun of him. And so, uh, so he, and he started to say, well, Misha, so from here you are living for London and he, so you should really be well fed. I don't advise you to eat anything in London. Uh, and so, and he says, especially I don't even advise you to eat any sushi. Then don't even go close to sushi. Uh, so if, you, but the safest thing to eat from, from which you won't for sure be poisoned is from plate in front of Vladimir Vladimir. So he takes plate in front of Putin and gives it to me. Uh, and so Putin suddenly drops the fork and our knife and he says, well, I have nothing to do with the murder of this Lithuanian guy. <laughs> and he got visibly annoyed. No, who the hell needed Lithuanian He was nobody. Why would I ever murder him? But it really got under his skin. Ever since, Russia has persistently denied responsibility for Litvinenko's death. But behind the jokes in Minsk lay tension. Putin warning Saakashvili he should drop the West or pay the price. He took me aside. It was meeting without witnesses. It was in a dark room uh, next to the main hall. Uh, we sat on the chairs. There was not even a table. So he like put my, his hand on my knee, like, like with nails and looking straight into my eyes, and you really under underestimating us. Uh, you cannot play around with Russia like this. The all-powerful Putin was increasingly inclined to show open contempt for his former allies. One thing that struck me, an anecdote about Putin, which reveals to me that he's probably not a very nice person, is Angela Merkel is afraid of dogs and made the mistake of divulging this to Putin. And one time when she was in Russia, what did he do but bring this enormous, horrible big dog into the room just so that he could enjoy the power that comes, that somewhat sadistic power that comes from making someone frightened. In 2008, the Georgian crisis boiled over as separatists rioted in the dissident Republic of South Ossetia. The Russian army massed on the border, with Putin certain the hapless West would do absolutely nothing. It was obvious that it was basically on the uh, edge of war. So Europeans and Americans started to make statements. Yeah, I tried to call Medvedev because Medvedev was officially the president, but then uh, they called me back from Russian protocol and said, Vladimir Putin wants to talk to you. So, and Putin says, well, why are you calling Medvedev? It's me who is doing all these things and I'm directing the whole operation. Uh, so I told him, look, you know, we are very worried and not only we are worried, look at the statements. We have White House, the European Union. He said, well, he said, yeah, I really saw the statements. They are really very hard, strong statements. And, they are, and he said lots of paper was spent on the statements. So he told me, Mikhail Nikolaevich, why don't you call your friends in the West and tell them to roll this paper and stick it in their asses. While the rest of the world is watching the Beijing Olympics. Vladimir Putin sends in the tanks for the first time since the collapse of the Soviet Union. What happened at that, that, that moment, uh, finally the Americans woke up. I have directed Secretary of Defense Bob Gates to begin a humanitarian mission to the people of Georgia headed by the United States military. This mission will be vigorous and ongoing. 
And one of the things that they leaked was that uh, Cheney wanted to hit the Russians with cruise missiles. Within 40 minutes after Bush's announcement, Russian troops advanced on uh, our capital was stopped. So Putin got the message. The West was horrified by the invasion and relieved at the pullback. But even a five-day war made Russians feel their country was strong again, a firm leader at its tiller. Worried European countries decide it's time to try and be friends again. I visited Moscow and I saw uh, then President Medvedev. This was in the period when um, Putin had stepped into being prime minister while, of course, still holding the reins of power. Medvedev is much more a normal European politician. Talking to him is, is a much less, you get a much less sinister feeling, really, than talking to President Putin. I escorted him to the Olympics when he came here in 2012. I took him to the Excel Center to see the judo. I know a bit about judo. I've done some judo, not as much as he has. Um, a Russian won the gold medal, which Putin enjoyed, of course, immensely, because he wasn't going to go back to Moscow until he had seen a Russian win a gold medal. He was going to stay as long as necessary. We had champagne, we had a, uh, you know, we, we had quite a party, and uh, we waved him off, um, knowing that they'd won a gold medal, with some relief that he didn't need to stay a couple of days. Two years later, the Sochi Olympics were intended to be another stepping stone in Russia's path to global dominance. The president poured vast amounts of time and money into the project. But the games also served to distract the world's cameras from his next bold foreign policy maneuver as Russia seized control of Crimea. Dictators never asked why, it's always why not. But we could see an acceleration if, uh, for Hitler, it, it took 20 months from Berlin Olympics to annexation of, of uh, uh, Austria. For Putin, it took only 20 days from Olympics to annexation of Crimea. Putin has developed a very clear, consistent approach in dealing with problems in those neighbors, which is to take a physical stake in them. Uh, something which is, every time he does it, is astonishing to Western opinion. Of course, it wouldn't be astonishing anymore because he's done it several times. But it is to physically take part of one of those countries, to stop that country functioning as a sovereign state. And that is how he arrests the arrival of uh, the growth of Western ideas. And of course was bold enough to do the same in Syria, uh, to physically intervene, in my view, emboldened by Western failure to intervene. One of the key features of the extreme narcissism of uh, the emperor is you lose the ability to distinguish your interests from the interests of the country. And so you and your nation's interests become identical. To the baffled West, Vladimir Putin looked arbitrary and out of control. But to his people, he looked like a true czar, happy to flout Western norms of behavior to safeguard Russia's vital interests. Then, one old rival decides to challenge the apparently invincible president. Boris himself had as close a relationship to power uh, as anyone. For many years, he was perceived as the heir apparent to Yeltsin. And then Putin takes that place. Uh, and, and of course, uh, neither of them can sort of let the other alone. Uh, Nemtsov, I think, for, for principled reasons, and Putin for reasons of insecurity and vengefulness. Boris Nemtsov started small. A pamphlet alleging that his nemesis had 
1,058 jets, two yachts, a summer palace, making Vladimir Putin the world's richest man. His co-author was a former government minister. Boris Nemtsov and myself, we were questioning the whole narrative that things got so much better under Putin that we should be just happy and let him be the lifetime one. We described a lot of uh, irregularities and serious problems that existed underneath the, the economically brilliant surface. Growing inequality, which became much higher than in the 1990s, growing corruption and institutionalized corruption, which also was never the case in the 90s because in the 90s it was all about bribes from businessmen to uh, bureaucrats. But under Putin it became bureaucrats completely affiliated with uh, making dirty money and actually it became their business and, and, and their only business to do so. You know, we are not perfect, but who actually is? Did I commit sins? Yes, I committed sins. But I never killed a person. I never slapped anybody by the face, either figuratively, either, you know, physically. And I never steal from anybody. I help a lot. And, you know, from time to time, it returns to me in a form of just unexpected support. I call him uh, Boris, but sometimes I have started to call him suspect. <laughs> but he was a man with a brilliant uh, sense of humor. He uh, was preparing the next pamphlet devoted to the annexion Crimea the very sensitive subject for Putin's regime. One winter's night, Boris Nemtsov starts to cross the Moskvaretsi bridge in the shadow of the Kremlin walls. Moments later, he is shot in the back and the head four times. I was, of course, shocked. I, I couldn't even imagine that it could, could happen in the 21st century with us in the center of Moscow. I immediately uh, came there on, on the bridge and uh, just was standing on the, on the body of uh, murdered my friend, just on the front of Kremlin wall. Well, just all Secret Service cam cameras just uh, installed. I was shocked. It was a real shock for me. I didn't think it was possible. I didn't think that it was possible. And I didn't know um, who was guilty of it. Despite the absence of any CCTV, Kremlin's cameras were being serviced that night. Four men are arrested for Nemtsov's murder, one a former para. But Nemtsov's supporters doubt ultimate responsibility lies with the former serviceman. If you stand there and look at the location, and you completely understand that in this place, it cannot happen without not only the permission, but the order from a person number one. Almost all people who hold great power for a long time begin to feel so special. I am so amazing. God must have something to do with this. Look, I can snap my fingers and they invade a country. I, can, I, I have power of life and death over man and woman. George W. Bush confessed he thought that God was involved in his decision on the Iraq war. Tony Blair hinted that we chat with God now and again. Julius Caesar had himself deified and he was still alive. With unchallenged authority at home and his nearest neighbors put in their place, the president is now able to spread his influence even further afield. It seems very evident 
that there was Russian interference in the election. The, the, the amount of evidence amassed by the intelligence agencies in the United States about Russia is unlikely to be wrong. A lot of people say, as an example, you know, Hillary likes to play tough with Russia. Uh, Putin looks at her and he laughs, okay? Putin's goals are strategic goals. He wants chaos because that's the, that's the, he's breathing uh, 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 air. He needs chaos because that's how he uh, uh, install his authorities inside and outside of Russia. He doesn't uh, want to compete. He cannot compete with the free world. But the moment it, it comes into wars and conflicts, he's dominant because he's very quick in making decisions. He doesn't bother about parliament, free press, uh, public opinion. So he immediately grabs an opportunity if, if, uh, op if it's presented. He looks at the world map looking for bargaining chips because for him it's all geopolitical casino. I think this is part of a pattern where there has quite probably been Russian interference in elections and referendums throughout Europe over the last few years, not always to achieve a specific result, but to diminish confidence in the democratic process uh, over time and to weaken the unity of the West. And it's not over. Нас никто не слушал. Послушайте сейчас. With just days to go to the election, the president announces a new global arms race. With nukes designed to elude any anti-missile system, present or future. С целью сдержать, сдержать Россию не удалось. Out on the campaign trail, there's a growing tide of suspicion that the president is just using his family friend as window dressing on his inevitable accession to power. So you're not the, the Kremlin's puppet then? Well, I'm tired of answering this oh. question. No, I'm not. Do you want to be the next president? Well, I want to but I'm not sure it will be this year. But I hope in six years, I'll have a chance to do that. To my mind, there is no way out. He will stay there for a long time. Even if he could arrange a handover that guaranteed he would not suffer the fate of Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein, how do you replace the incredible mainlining into your reward network of exceptional power? There's an awful bleakness and blackness out there awaiting you. <laughs>